we're learning about Jewish rules and laws of war and ethics and values. And uh, we came to the part about the land of Israel. Keep in mind, it's our only country throughout our history. So if we're going to be making war and we're not a particularly empire building nation, but rather a nation that seeks to have our promised land and hold on to it, the laws of war sooner or later were going to come to fighting for Israel, uh, the land of Israel and the role of the land of Israel. And last time, today, and next class will be about the unique role of the land of Israel. Now, very briefly reviewing what I did last time, very, very briefly, we learned in the text of Rambam, um, and we refreshed in our memories that Rambam is a code of Jewish law. Mishnah Torah is a code of Jewish law. It's not a political treatise where we're talking about politics and we're, and, and we're not arguing as polemics might nowadays, opinion articles about should Israel give up territory? Should Israel go into Rafiach? Should Israel do this? Should Israel do that? Rambam is about, here's the law. It's not like, is, is pork good for you? Is pork bad for you? It, you're not allowed to eat pork. Is, should Shabbos be on Saturday? Should Shabbos be on Sunday? Shabbos is Saturday, Friday night, Saturday. And other people can write opinion pieces about this stuff, but that's the law. So Rambam, here in talking about the laws of war, is talking about Israel. We're not allowed to give up an inch of Israel, or as they say in Israel, a centimeter or a millimeter, because they're on metric system. And you're not allowed to give up land. Not allowed to give up land. So we talked last class on the subject two weeks ago, but don't we have exceptions in Judaism to save lives? You're not allowed to eat on Yom Kippur, but if it'll save a life on Yom Kippur, if a person will die by fasting that Yom Kippur and can remain alive by eating that Yom Kippur, we make an exception. And you're not supposed to drive on Shabbat. But if a pregnant lady goes into labor on Shabbat, her husband's allowed to drive her to the hospital, but you're not supposed to drive on Shabbat. But it would save a life, potentially. So we make an exception. Uh, you're not allowed to eat pork. Let's say a young man is drafted by the Tsar into the Russian army where they had a 15 year, in, in, uh, they brought you in an induction of 15 years. So you had to eat what they gave you. And they serve pork and they did not serve kosher meat. So the question becomes, you're serving in the Tsar's army and you're limited to pork. What are you gonna do? You can starve to death in the name of Kashrut. When the question was asked of Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev, he said, if all they serve you is pork, and that's what you need to stay alive, then during the period you're in the Tsar's army, you can eat pork. And then he added, but don't suck the bones. Okay. So we know that in Judaism, to save a life, where life otherwise is in danger, we're allowed to make exceptions. So the question arises, and we talked about it two weeks ago, how about with the land of Israel? Let's say you have someone like Arafat or whatever, and... He's telling you, if you give me Judea, Samaria, what, he, what they call the West Bank, then we'll make peace and there'll be no war. So you're being presented with an opportunity to save lives that otherwise will be endangered if you give up territory. Are you allowed, just to, as you're allowed to eat on Yom Kippur if it's life or death, you're allowed to eat pork, life or death, you're allowed to drive to the hospital, Shabbos, life or death, are you allowed to give up land, life or death? And I explain there are two schools of thought. And again, I'm doing this really quickly compared to what I did two weeks ago. One school of thought is, yeah, we have that principle. You can you can make waivers to save lives, but we apply it in the question of the land of Israel the way we do with Yom Kippur. If a rabbi is presented by a congregant, a worshiper with a situation that rabbi, I can't fast on Yom Kippur because of health reasons, the rabbi is not qualified to make a medical decision on his own unless it's really very clear cut stuff or he's shown a piece of paper by a doctor. Rather, the rabbi is supposed to consult with the expert in that particular area, the doctor, the person's doctor. Person says, for example, I've got a diabetes thing or whatever it might be. And the rabbi will consult with that doctor, general practitioner, maybe it's a specific doctor, what exactly is the situation? How far can my worshiper congregant go 
on Yom Kippur. And the rabbi consults with the doctor. The rabbi has to remember he is not a doctor. But at the same time, the rabbi has to understand he is a rabbi. And I know in my own career that there have been times I've consulted with doctors on behalf of individuals who had questions. And once in a while, when you run with a non-Jewish doctor, it's smooth. They tell you what's going on medically and then you make a decision. With Jewish doctors, every so often they're not religious, but they think they're, it's like the Chuck Schumers of doctors that suddenly they're, they're the guardians of Israel. And a doctor who doesn't keep kosher, doesn't keep Shabbos, and he's on the phone with the rabbi. And it's happened to me, all my colleagues, we've run into this, where, where the doctor says, rabbi, this guy can eat on Yom Kippur. And well, okay, let me just ask you a question. You don't have to ask me. I'm making a medical decision. I, I understand that according to Judaism, it's the doctor that makes the decision. And you're not going to get into an argument. What are you going to get into talking with the doctor? So you're respectful to the doctor and you ask for the doctor. You try to get from the doctor how the doctor came up with his or her decision. And then afterwards, you, you make the final decision. So if the doctor just off the top of his head, her head, the same stuff, you have to get the expert's opinion. And then the rabbi has to meld that with what the rabbi knows of Jewish law. So in the same way, as far as can you sign away land of Israel? Can you give up parts of the land of Israel to save lives? So the same of, of the two schools of thought. One school of thought is the school of thought that to save lives, maybe you can give up land. So you have to do it like with Yom Kippur. You consult the experts. Who are the experts on this subject? Generals, military generals. And we said last class, not former generals who now are politicians, but active serving, active duty generals. Because an active duty general is in the field. He sees what's flying at his pen, what rockets, what strategy he's got access to, all the inside information, what's going on in the battlefield. Once he becomes a politician, he's no longer acting, even if he says he is, purely as an expert in military matters. Now he's become a politician. So now he's starting to mix in not only will it save Jewish lives, but I want to continue getting weapons and Canada is going to cut off weapons, and, and Biden is threatening this, and Kamala Harris is threatening this, and, and the International Court of Justice is threatening this, and they suddenly become politicians, which is different from, will it save or endanger lives? A little bit it's related, a little bit it's not. For example, and I gave all three examples as I wrap up my review from two weeks ago, when um, Yitzhak Rabin was a general. He never gave up an inch. Once he became prime minister, he signed the 1993 Oslo Accords that gave Yasser Arafat Judea and big chunks of Judea and Samaria, what they call the Palestine Authority. But he never did that when he was a general. He did that as a politician. Ehud Barak, when he was a general, never gave up an inch. When he became prime minister, he made a decision, let's march, let's give up southern Lebanon. We were in southern Lebanon. Uh, we Israel was in southern Lebanon, and he said, let's get out of southern Lebanon, and let's just unilaterally, unilaterally give it to the Arabs, and don't even negotiate. Just let them have it. Who, it. who who needs it? So we gave it up, something he never would have done as a general, never did as a general. And in fact, what ended up happening is he created a vacuum with no precautions to prevent it from becoming a terror nest hole. And next thing you know, uh, Nasrallah moved in with Hezbollah. And then the third one was Ariel Sharon. When Sharon was a general, he never gave up any land. He was known as the bulldozer. He bulldozed the opposition. He was really, he meant business. Became prime minister and he just got tired of all the aggravation from Gaza. And he made the same decision in Gaza that Ehud Barak made in southern Lebanon. Let's just get out of there. Let them have it. They want it. Let them have it. It's a nice place. Let them have all the investment we have already put into that place. And they'll leave us alone. They'll be busy running their own government. They'll have to maintain a health ministry and a, uh, a water and electricity and infrastructure. And they'll have political parties. They'll be, they'll be busy and they, they'll leave us alone. And he was, of course, wrong, as we know every morning when we wake up and throughout the day when we read the news. So you had three perfect examples of generals who, when they were generals, would not give up an inch. But then when they became politicians, 
Sharon gave up Gaza, Ehud Barak gave up South Lebanon, and uh, Rabin gave up Judea, some parts of Judea Samaria. And we see those results. So one of the two schools of thought of rabbinic of schools of thought, not, poli not politicians, not political schools of thought, rabbinic schools of thought, halakh schools of thought, is that you're not allowed to give up land of Israel, but to save lives, if in consulting with active duty generals, they tell you you really will save serious lives, it could be permitted to give up some territory. That has never been put to the test. Any giving up of land has always been done by former generals, now politicians, active generals, never were consulted by rabbis. And the modern day state of Israel does not make its decisions anyway based on rabbis. So it's not as though the Knesset is waiting to hear what the chief rabbinate rules. But in terms of what we're clear, our class is halacha. What is Jewish law? So that is Jewish law. And that's one of the two schools of thoughts. One of the two schools of thought. And the other school of thought, which actually is a majority opinion, is that you're not allowed to give up land altogether. Even if the generals who are active duty tell you it'll save lives. Even to save a life, you're never allowed to give up an inch of Eretz Israel. How could that be? Because, and that's, that's the essence of the thinking, because the very act of sovereignty means that lives will be lost. There is no such thing as a country that is sovereign, that can remain sovereign, without that in itself leading to the loss of life. Even neutral countries, Switzerland, Belgium before World War I, I mentioned last class two weeks ago, Belgium before World War I was a, uh, a neutral country. Germany to its east decided they wanted to invade France to their west. And the only way Germany could get into France was by marching through Belgium, neutral Belgium. So Germany asked Belgium for permission. We don't wanna bother you, we know you're neutral. We have no aspirations to take any of your land. We would just like permission safe passage to march through Belgium to go into France so we could go and attack France. And Belgium said, no, we're a neutral country. If we allow you to attack, it's like we're taking sides. We're facilitating your invasion of France. And anyway, we can't have foreign, part of our being a neutral country is we cannot have foreign uh, soldiers on our land. So Germany had contempt and went into Belgium anyway. They marched through Belgium into France. They violated Belgian neutrality. And that's why when World War I ended, that's why like most of us are not really so knowledgeable about World War I, but that's why Germany paid such a heavy price for World War I, because they started it. They created the whole mess. And they created it by invading Belgian neutrality. My point here is that Belgium was neutral and they lost a lot of thousands of people while being neutral. You can't help it. The United States sometimes is involved in war that it wants to be in, but World War II, nobody was looking for war with Japan. And they sucker punched us on December 7, 1941. They bombed Pearl Harbor, it was a sucker punch. We weren't at war. If anybody had any eyes on anything, they, they, they were keeping their eyes on what's going on with Germany. Germany in 1939 had invaded Poland and there had been all that stuff with the Sudetenland. No one really, I mean, behind the scenes, we knew things were heating up with Japan and we might have a problem, but nobody expected a war that moment. And same thing happened with 9-11. You have a country, you don't know what nut, where in the world is living for no purpose other than to bring death and destruction to your people. But that's what it is to have a country. So the halacha, according to that second school of thought, are you allowed to give up land in Eretz Israel for peace? The halacha is, according to that second school of thought, the very act of sovereignty in the land of Israel means that people will be killed. There will be wars. And if you do give up land for peace, you'll eventually have other wars anyway. 
you can't have a country without war. You can try your best and good luck. And you can reduce the amount of fighting and death if that's your national ideology and you make it your business to try to stay out of trouble. But it comes with the it comes with the name sovereignty. So we learned that you're not allowed to give up land of Eretz Israel. And this becomes an important part of the Jewish ethic of war. And now we're going to go to the Tanakh. We're going to go to the Bible. Some interesting stuff here. As always, some of it, some of it, some of us may know. Some of us maybe don't know. Let me just uh, remember to. Um, okay, some of us may know. Some of us may not know. But uh, it's important refresher, no matter what. And for many of us, it's a, a particularly important refresher. So here we go. Let's just get that out of the way. Now we're going to take this out of the way. Okay, here we go. Let's remember some of the territory that we're going to be talking about. Here is the land of Israel and the tribes. It's a very nice map. I like this one. Very nice, very clear. There is King David's Yehuda, Judah, with Jerusalem on the border and Benjamin, and his, which was also part of the country of the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, Hebron. And in the pan, in the orange brown tan are the non Jewish countries nearby Moab, Ammon, Aram. Aram, in biblical times, that's modern day Syria. You could see it's got the capital Damascus, even in biblical times. Ammon, to refresh your memories, Avraham Avinu, our father Abraham, traveled with his wife Sarah Sarah, and with Lot. Lot was his nephew, the son of his brother Haran. Haran had died at a young age. For those of you who remember the story of the fiery furnace, uh, we won't take our time on that now. And he left behind his son Lot, Avraham's nephew who traveled with Lot. At some point as Lot became prosperous because he was blessed through Abraham, he became so prosperous that he split ways. His his uh, shepherds and 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 cowboys uh, got into strife with Avraham's shepherds because, like, there's just they were so prosperous that they were trying to graze their sheep, and each was saying, "You're taking up too much. You're taking up too much." So Avraham said, "Look, we don't need to have an argument." It's a whole big country out here. You take what you want. I'll take what I want. I'll take what's left over. And so Lot saw the fertile lands of Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Amorah, and he took that. After Sodom and Amorah were destroyed by God with fire and brimstone, you'll remember Lot fled thanks to angels of God whom HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent to save him by virtue of his special merit of being Avraham's nephew. And so Lot fled with his wife and two of his daughters. Two other daughters had married locals in Sodom and Amorah and stayed with their husbands. So they got burned alive with everyone else. But Lot got out with his wife and his two daughters. The wife turned around and became a pillar of salt. You remember that story. And Lot and his two daughters ended up in a cave. In that cave, the two daughters righteously, not, not out of immorality, but righteously believed they were the only three remaining people in the world. That the entire universe had been destroyed except for those three. So the two daughters each got their father to impregnate them in the cave. One night, one daughter got impregnated. The next night, the other daughter got impregnated. They basically got him drunk and they got him to impregnate them. And from one daughter came a boy who was named Moav, like Mayav from father. And the other was called Amon, from the word Am, like one nation. And over time, that boy Moab had children who had children who had children, and they became a nation. And Amon became a nation. God said to the Jews, as we're coming in off the map, as we're coming in from the Sinai Desert, God said to the Jews, you're going to the promised land, but you may not attack Ammon 
and you may not attack Moab. Ammon belongs to the descendants of Lot. Moab belongs to the other descendants of Lot. And through the merit of Abraham, through whom Lot, with whom Lot, Lot traveled, their land is given to them by God. Just as I'm giving you Eretz Israel, I'm giving them Ammon and Moab. And you may not attack it. Here's another map. This gives you a little bit more of that picture. Again, Ammon and Moab. And this was Aram. Same map, different map, but same idea. But this has Edom also, as we want to see it. So um, you have Aram, Syria, Ammon, the descendants of Lot, Moab, the other descendants of Lot, and Edom. Torah tells us that um, that Yitzchak and Rivka had twin sons, Yaakov and Esav, Jacob and Esau. Esav also is known as Edom, which means it's a variation on the word red or ruddy, R-U-D-D-Y, because his skin was very ruddy. He was very red skinned. And his people were called not Esavites for Esau, but Edomites. Same thing. So just as Israel abutted Aram, which you're allowed to attack, Ammon, which we're not allowed to attack because of Lot, Moab, we're not allowed to attack. The Jews also were told, you are not allowed to attack Edom because God has given Edom to Esau and his descendants as a blessing for Esau being a descendant of Yitzchak and Rivka, Isaac and Rebekah, even though Esau came out bad, the fact that he's a descendant of Isaac and Rebekah, Yitzchak and Rivka, gave him a special merit for all time. So the Jews had a fascinating, call it a dilemma or conundrum, as they're coming across from the Sinai Desert to their destiny in the Promised Land. And by the way, remember again, the bodies of water. Here's the Lake of Kinneret, or the Sea of Galilee. This is the Jordan River. And this is the Salt Sea, Yama Melech, the Dead Sea. And you see, everything west of the Jordan River is Eretz Israel, all of Judea, Samaria. We are indigenous. In fact, east of the Jordan River, also Eretz Israel, east of the Jordan River, the East Bank, Got that? That's God. That's Reuven. God, because here's the Jordan River. Reuven, God. And part of Menashe, the green here. Menashe mostly is in west of Jordan, a little bit east of Jordan, plus two full tribes, Reuven and God. Again, one more look at it. Ammon and Moab. Edom is below, below the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea. And this is Eretz Israel. Okay. So as the Jews, the conundrum I was referring to, are coming through the Sinai Desert to their promised land, they got to get through. Call it Belgium. They have no designs on these countries. They're not allowed to. Amon, Moab, or Edo. They have to get through. Here's where they want to get to. And they're going to dispossess the Canaanites. Battle of Jericho, etc., etc. The seven nations, Canaanite, Chiti, Yavusi, Girgashi, Prizi. Okay. So let's refresh our memories. In Sefer Bamidbar, chapter 20 of the Book of Numbers, by Ashlach Moshe Malachim, Kadesh Melech Moses, Moshe is taking the people to the promised land. And they're now about to encounter Edom. Get that one. Let's get the one with Edom. Edom. Okay. They're now about to come in through Edom. He sends a message. Can we go through? Komar Achicha Yisrael. 
here I'm speaking to you, Edomites, as your brother, because we're Jacob and you're Asa. So we're brothers. I tell you, it's like the United States and England. At one point, 200 years ago, everybody who started the United States pretty much, the 13 colonies, were Brits. And they were kind of brothers. There they were. I tell you, Dr. Kotla Ashermat Satanu, Ashermat Satnu, you know all that we've been through. And he tells them the whole story. Moshe tells them the whole story. This is what happened. And now we're just asking, we want to go to our promised land. We're asking for permission to go through your land. We're not going to deviate. We'll just go on the main road. We're not going to go in your fields. We're not going to go in your vineyards. We're not going to use up your water. We're going to go through King's Highway. If you come from Brooklyn, New York, you may remember a major thoroughfare was called King's Highway. And in fact, here in, in Southern California, in the San Fernando Valley, Valley in a lot of, and, and Orange County, and a lot of other places, they have places called El Camino Royale. El Camino Royale is the same thing as King's Highway. And it comes, that, that expression comes from this passage, Dera Hamelech. It's the King's Highway. So we're not going to deviate, uh, we're not going to go on your fields or your vineyards. We're not going to drink any water from your wells. We're just going to go El Camino Real, King's Highway. We're not going to go left or right. And we'll stay straight on the road till we get through your border. We're coming, let's say, up here. We're trying to get here. So we'll just go straight. We won't even stop to tour at Petra. We'll just go straight. Deal? By Omer Love Edom, and Edom says, Lo ta'avor bi, pen you don't dare come into my territory, or we will we will confront you with weapons. We'll come out with the sword, or we'll go to war. And Moshe tried, look, we'll keep to the beaten track. But Mesila, and if we or our cattle drink your water, we'll pay for it. We ask only for passage on foot. It's a small matter. Raka in davar. It's nothing. Baraglayavora. Bayomer lotavor. Not only did Edom say, again, you can't go through, but he'd say, Edom, the Kroto, they called up their troops, they called up their army, and they massed at the border. Ba'am kaved uviat chazaka. Not only did they stop negotiating, but they put a fully murderous army at the border ready to slaughter the Jews if anybody breaks the breaks the boundary. Edom would not allow the Jews to pass their border, so the Jews had to find another route. So we're trying to get into the land of Israel. We can't go that way, so we got to go, I guess, where are we going to go? This way. Just trying to figure out. By Asumi Kadesh, we have Oban Israel, Clay Gahor, Ahor. And then they go past, and it's at this point, uh, Aharon the Kohen dies around this time. And as this is all going on, uh, the Jews are trying to figure out where they're going to go. And we come to verse 21 or so. Okay. By Ashlach Yisrael Malachim El Sirchon. Melcha Emory Lemur. Very important. Here's what happened in the meantime. There was another country called Emory. E M O R I in English, though of course it's not in English words. Aleph Memva Vreshud. Emory. They are one of the seven biblical nations that we are commanded to have uh, destroyed in assuming sovereignty over Eretz Israel. By God's grace, the Amorites actually conquered the land. They went to war before we ever showed up, and they took the land of the Moabites. See what that did? What God did, he prepared, a Kodesh Baruch who prepared a pathway for us to make it to Eretz Israel, notwithstanding that we were forbidden to enter land of Moab or Ammon as part of his promised to Lot. Since the Amori had conquered the land, 
and the Lot people at that moment were not sovereign, we were allowed to go into that land if we had to in war against the Mori. Interesting. So we continue. So Moshe sends messengers to the Amorites. Virtually the same language. Let us go through the fields. Let us go through your like King's Highway. And we're not going to go into your fields. And we're not going to go into your vineyards. And we're not going to drink water from your wells. We're just, just going to stick with King's Highway. Can we go? And Sichon, the Amorite, likewise, as the Edomites, refused to let the Jews through. But the thing is, with the Edomites, we're not allowed to fight them. Look, if the Edomites actually would strike first, then it's a Mohammed mitzvah, as we've been learning over previous weeks. If we are attacked, then you don't need a Sanhedrin. You don't need any kind of rabbinic ruling. If the nation is attacked, as happened on October 7, Shabbat of Shemini Atzeret, it becomes a Muhammad mitzvah, a Torah commanded war, and everybody goes to fight. And there's no need for any uh, any, any declaration of war by any, any approval on the halacha, on the secular law of the modern state of Israel. They have to get uh, they have to get it approved by the Knesset. But on the halacha, in a time of a Ben Mikdash, if the nation is attacked, the king's takes everybody to war. Edom did not attack. They stood on their boundary, like in football, a goal line defense. They weren't going to go offside and attack us first. But if we tried to penetrate their line, they were ready to slaughter us. So we were not allowed to fight them. But the Amorites, they're under different roles. We have not been commanded not to fight, to, quite the contrary. We've been commanded at some point to wipe them out. Sichon did not allow the Jews to enter his, his boundaries. Sichon gathered his armies, his nation, to encounter the Jews at war. By Avohyatza, he came to a place that the King James Version calls Jehaz, Yatz, Yud Hay Tzadi. And by Lechem Yisrael, he started war. He started the war. So the Jews were attacked, and the Jews won. Think of all the wars we've had with the Arabs. Um, 1948, Israel did not want a war. Israel wanted a small little country, independence, leave us alone. Keep your hands off us, and let's live with Shalom. And the Arabs made war, and they lost more land. 1967, Israel pleaded with Jordan, stay out of this war. This is Nasser. He wants war. And he's getting Syria into the war. We don't want a third front. Stay out of the war. And King Hussein decided to join the war. And so he lost. And what he lost, he's never getting back. Namely, Judea, Samaria, East Jerusalem. That's how that all happened 50 years ago, 47 years ago. 57 years ago. And Israel was attacked and they won. But Irash and Artso and Israel inherited, not conquered. The Hebrew word for conquer, by Yechbash. That's not the word in the Torah. Not by Yechbash. Not that Israel conquered the land. By Irash, Israel inherited the land. See that? Took possession. That's not a good translation. A Yerusha is an inheritance. Because God had set that side a lot, had set that land aside to be part of Eretz Israel. So we got the land from our known, try to remember these names, and I'll, I'll come back to them. There's a reason I'm going to ask you to remember three or four names of places are known, are known, are known. Yabok, Yabok, Adbeneamon. And so what ended up happening is, so what ended up happening is that they took all the land up to the boundary of Ammon. So Moshe and the Jews, having been attacked by Sichon, the king of Amori, who had conquered the land from the Moabites, and therefore we were not making war against Moab, but against Amori, 
we took Arnon, we took Yabok up to the boundary of Amon. Okay. And Israel settled in all the towns of the Amorites, in Cheshbon, etc., etc. Cheshbon was the city of Sihon, the king of the Amorites. That was his capital. He had fought against the former king of Moab. That's what I was telling you. See, there had been a Moab. What was Sihon doing there? He conquered that land which made it conquerable for us. He had fought against the former king of Moab and taken all the land from him as far as Arno. And that's, and we're going to skip some of this. It's just a uh, woe to you, but there's one we're here to, to know also. Oylecha Moab. And so a song, a biblical song was written that is quoted in, in the Chumash. Uh, the song of the great victory. Many wars come with Victory songs as part of winning the war. And so, you know, like the Civil War, we had not only victory songs, there's always a lot of songs associated with war. When Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah, hurrah. That was a song up in the in the north, and then Dixie was the song in the south. Um, so it was a song. Woe to you, Moab. You are undone, people of Chamosh. What's Chamosh? Chamosh, remember this name for a little bit. We already said, remember the name Arnon and remember the name Yabok. And Kamosh is the name of their God. Just as among the Canaanites, their God was Baal. Our God is Hashem. Elokeinu. Other names that we have for Hashem. HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And among the Moabites, their God was Kamosh. That's, so woe to you, Moab. You are undone, people of commotion, etc., etc., etc. Okay. But Yeshiv Yisrael be Eretz Emori, and the Jews ended up in the land of the Emorites. And then Moshe sent spies to go to Yazir, and they captured more of the Emori land. They marched on and went up the road to Bashan and King Og. Og Bashan And as they reached an area called Bashan, whose king was OG, Og, and he went to a city called Edrei to have a milchama, a war. Again, they started war with the Jews. God said to Moshe, don't fear him, for I give him and all his troops and his land into your hand. You'll do to him just as you did to the other one. It's as though God would say, don't be afraid of King Hussein of Jordan. I'm going to hand him over to you the way I just handed you Nasser's Egypt. And they took that land. And the Jews, having taken the land, reached the steps of Moab that no longer were held by Moab, but by the Amorites, who now have been wiped out, right near the Jordan River, the other side of Jericho. So the Jews went through the Sinai Desert. That's why I'm flying this, these arrows, try to, and couldn't get through Edom. They wouldn't let us, and they didn't make war. They set up a goal line defense, and we're not allowed to attack them, because they are the brother of Yaakov, Esau. So Moab, having been conquered by Emori, we were allowed to go. And better yet, Sithon attacked us. So he started it, as later did Og, the king of Bashan. So we were able to liberate all that was purple, putting us at the eastern bank of the, jo of, of the Jordan River, actually, because this included some of this. Okay. Here we go. So we have now covered chapters 20 and 21 from the Torah in Sefer of Amidbar. And now we go to Sefer Shoftim, the book of Judges, chapter 11. The story of Yiftach. Here we go. Story of Yiftach. And this is so wild. For those of us who know it, we know it. And it's never as exciting 
when someone tells you a surprise, you already know. But for those of us who don't know the story of Yiftach, I promise you, this is great. This is really going to hit in a very unique way. Again, if you know the story of Yiftach, you know the story. But if you don't know it, you listen to this story. This is the Bible. This is not a midrash. This is not me telling you once upon a time, many, many years ago, and they lived heavily after, happily ever after. This is just, here we go. Here we go. Yiftach was a judge. First of all, he had a very um, undignified ancestry. He's the daughter of a prostitute. He's the daughter. That would no. They they, they didn't have transgender in those years. Uh, he was the son of a prostitute. Uh, there's nothing worse. That's not even great honor and lineage, even in immoral, corrupt America, and the rest of the immoral, corrupt Western world. But in those days, that was absolute shunning. You were just shunned from society. The Iftach Giladi. Hayagi Borchayil, Yiftach, was a mighty man. Ben Isha Zona, Ben Zona, that's a curse today in modern Israeli street Hebrew. Hebrew does not have dirty words. The dirty, that's why it's called Lashon HaKodesh, the holy language. There's no dirty words in Hebrew. If you go in the street of Israel and someone's a curse someone, they use Arabic words. Because there's no Hebrew words for cursing. Even the word, there is a word for, let's say, feces. But really, it's it's the word feces. And so since there's no dirtier word, they may use the word feces for the dirty equivalent of it. But the language does not have dirty words. And those of you who have some experience know that like the strongest curse in all of Hebrew is ben zona, uh, which is to say, you're the son of a prostitute. All the stronger languages, American, English has dirty words. Arabic has dirty words. He literally was a son of a prostitute. Bayolid Gilad at Yiftach. So his father Gilad gave birth to him. Eshet Gilad lo banim. Now, Gilad had a quote-unquote legitimate, not quote-unquote, had a legitimate wife. And she gave birth to a lot of sons. And as those boys grew up, and they had a stepbrother in their house, the son of a prostitute, we don't want you here. And we don't want you inheriting our father's estate. Because you were born to a different woman, different from all the rest of us. We all are the children of the same father and legitimate same mother. And you're from, just get out of here. He had a very tough childhood. He had to flee from them. He, he moved somewhere else and he, he, was, he was like branded. Uh, not, not literally, but like in that old uh, TV show, branded with a coward's name. Uh, what do you do when you're branded? When you're... So um, he was branded, the son of a prostitute. So what he did was he gathered on Hashim Reikim, he gathered men of low character who had nothing better to find in their own lives. And he was able to create like a little, like a little band or an army or a gang. And they would go raiding and that's how they supported themselves. What can you do? Oh boy. So all of a sudden, the people of Ammon decide to make war on Israel. By now, this is before the kings. This is before King Saul and King David, before prophets like Shmuel. This is the era of the judges. Deborah, Samson, uh, Gidon, Ehud, the uh, different judges of Sefer Shoftim. And we're right now covering the story of the judge Yiftach. He's, I just gave away that he's going to become he's going to become very important because Hamon is attacking and nobody can fight him. 
And as the Ammonites made war against the Jews, the Jews did not feel they could fight back physically successfully. They, they very, very ruefully went back hat in hand, so to speak, to the Yiftach, whom they expelled from their family, and they begged him. He's the strongest, most, most battle-tested guy among the Jews, and they begged him to come back and lead them in battle to protect us against Ammon because the Ammonites want to cross the Jordan River and take parts, well, who knows how much of Eretz Israel. And so, they said to Yiftach, please come back and be our leader, be our chief, so that we can fight the Ammonites. You can imagine how he felt. And Yiftach says to the elders of Gilad, ah, 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 you always hated me, but to Gorshuni in Beit Avi, and you expelled me from my own father's household. And now you're coming. Now you want me to come and protect you. Like forget you. And the elders of Gilad kept pleading. Lachain ata with an iron. Now shavnu You're right. You're right. Our bad, and that's why we're begging you. The Halachni Mana, please come with us. Please make war. Lead us in battle. Be our leader. For all the settlers, for all those who inhabit the Gilad. So Yiftach says as follows. All right. I'll do it. I'll do it because I'm sure this is God's will. You are bringing me back to fight against the Ammonites and God will give, if God will hand the Ammonites over to us, if God will give them to us, then we will win. And I indeed will be your leader also after the war. I'm not just coming to fight. This is not going to be like Old soldiers never die. They just fade away. I'm not going to fade away. I will be the judge and remain the leader of the nation. That's the cost. That's the price. And they said back to him, okay, so shall it be. God hears this exchange between us. And exactly what you're saying, we agree to. That's what we'll do. We will follow you in battle, and we will follow you after battle. So Yiftach went with the elders of Gilad, who made him their leader. By the very Yiftach, it called the Varav of Ne'er Shem Mitzpah. And now, at Mitzpah, which is a famous place later, because that's where Shmuel Hanavi often would be, Yiftach repeats publicly the formal agreement. I am your leader. I am your battle leader. I'm the chief of staff. You'll be fighting behind me. We will fight Amon. If God will give us victory, may he give us victory. I will continue afterwards as the leader. Get a load of this exchange. Yiftach sends messengers to the king of Ammon. Again, this is Ammon. And this is Yiftach. And he knows a war is about to start. And he says to him, Ma li volach, I want peace. What have you against me? I don't want a war. Please, we, we could still avoid war. Ki vota elai li lachem ba'artsi, that you are coming against me to make war against my land. I don't want war. I'm asking you, please, let's not have a war. And the response from the king of Ammon to the messengers of Yiftach. 
you took our land. You are colonialists, imperialists, settlers. We were indigenous, and you took our land. We want our land back. When Israel came from Egypt, they seized the land that is mine. When you fled from Egypt, you took our land. We want our land back. May Arnon, remember, I asked you to try to remember the names of Arnon and Yabok. May Arnon vi Adha Yabok vi Adha You and I, uh, all of us just now learned together in Sefer of Amidbar, the book of Numbers, the battle between the Jews and Sichon, the king of Amori, Og, the king of Bashan, in which we took Arnon and Yabok up to the Jordan. Now, centuries later, along they come and they say, we want our land back. You occupied our land. You are an occupation force. It's occupied land. It's our land. Biata with an ayin, and now, hashiva at hen b'shalom. So let's make peace. We're offering you peace. The Ammonite is saying, I'm offering you peace. All we want is our land back. Just give us back our occupied territories that you're talking about. By the way, keep in mind, don't forget, they're talking about the East Bank of the Jordan River. This is what they're talking about. The East Bank, they would never, not even these people, would never have the temerity to claim being indigenous on the western side of the Jordan in Judea Samaria. Everyone knew that's Israel. Judea Samaria, you're talking... When you talk Judea Samaria, you're talking about places like Jerusalem, Beit Lechem, Hebron, where Abraham and Sarah, Yitzchak and Rivka, and Yaakov and Leah, and Beit Lechem, where Rivka is buried. I mean, nobody would have the temerity to suggest that Judea Samaria is anything but Jewish. Their argument, though, is over Reuven and God and the land that was taken from Ammon. At the time that Ammon was, subject, was subjugated by Emori. So, he says, because Israel occupied our land. When you were leaving Egypt, Arnon and Yabok and Yardin, so we don't want war with you. Just agree to make a peace, two-state solution. You could have a Jewish state west of the Jordan, and east of the Jordan will be an our own state, a two-state solution. And we'll have peace, everybody will be happy. By Yosef od Yiftach, and Yiftach responds. By Shlach Malachim Melch ben Ammon, and he sends messengers to convey his retort to the king of Ammon. You want me to give up Jewish land? You want me to give up Reuven, God, east of the Jordan? This is Eretz Yisrael. And the messengers say as follows. Thus says Yiftach, the leader of the Jews. The Jews did not take the land of Moab. The Jews did not take the land of Moab and the land of Ammon. We didn't occupy your land. Rather, here's what happened. Just let's let's uh, let's review the history. We were coming out of Egypt, and we traveled through the wilderness to the Sea of Reeds, Yamsuf. We reached Kadesh, and then we made an approach to the people of Edom. In case you forgot. Okay, so we made an approach to the people of Edom, the people of Edom, before we made the approach to you guys. And we asked for permission to go through Edom. We had no designs in anyone else's land. And the king wouldn't let us. Then we went to the king of Moab and we said, we have no designs on your land. 
We just want to go through to conquer our land. And the king then in charge of Moab, namely Sichon, the king of Amori, lo ava, he wouldn't let us, he refused. We're stuck. So we continued on our journey. And we had to go all the way circuitously around Moab, around Edom, around Moab. We had to find some kind of little area we could get through in order to reach our journey. So, Vayavo Mimisrach Shemesh Laretz Moab, Vayachanun Ve'ever Arnon. And we finally went to the uh, other side of Arnon. We stay out of the Moabite territory. We sent messengers to Sichon, the king of Amori, the king of Cheshbon. And we asked Sichon, the Amorite king, the one who is based in the capital of Cheshbon, may we please go through your land to our destination, to our intended homeland. And Sichon would not let us go through his land. Not only that, on top of that, he gathered all of his armies and he engaged Israel in battle. He started the war. And we weren't looking to occupy territory that was his. Rather, God Almighty gave us his land. God Almighty inspired, incited, induced in him to make war on us, a war that we won and from which we emerged with his land, Vayakum, and we, we smote them. By Irash Yisrael, it called Eretz Emori. And the Jews ended up inheriting, again, Vayirash, not Vayichbosh. We inherited all the land of the Amorites. Yoshefa Eretz Ahi, the ones who were dwelling in that land. By Yershu, it called Gevul HaEmori, may our known, Viad Yaboku, Minamibar, Adi Yarden. And we ended up inheriting all the land of the Amori. Those cities, again, that I mentioned, keep in mind, remember, are known, Yabok, until the Jordan. Viata with an iron, and now, Hashem, okay, Israel, Harishan, Amori. The Lord God of Israel uprooted the Amorites, Mipnei Amo Israel, before the Jewish, before the Jewish nation. It was God's will that we would have that land. We tried to avoid having to go to war for it. And they attacked us. So we fought back in defense, self-defense. And it was God's will that we emerged from that war with that land. The Atta And now you want to possess that land? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Now it's ours. Hello, I told you, remember the name Kamosh. I mentioned that was the God of the Moabites, that our God is Hashem, Elokeinu, Shakai, uh, uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We have names for God, something like seven names for God. And the Canaanites' God, they're called uh, Baal, and other nations have other gods. And the Moabites have the God Hamosh. I mentioned, I pointed out that name. And so y Yiftach says, you want to make war now, we're not giving up our land. That is our land. We're not occupying that land. We liberated that land. We didn't try to liberate it. We didn't want to go to war for it. You, the other side, started the war. But we won in self-defense, and we're keeping it. And if you want to make war now, whatever your God, Kamosh, gives you in such a battle, you will inherit. And whatever God Almighty will give us in battle, if you make a war against us, then we will inherit that too. As we were saying to Jordan in 1967, stay out of it. Because if you make war and you don't win, but you lose, we're going to keep it. Be ata, atov tovata. Do you think you're any better than other biblical kings who made war against us 
and ended up losing their land toss, like Balak, his Torah portion name for him, the king of Moab, he made war on us. Look what happened to him. Do you think you're going to come out any better? Three hundred years we have been here, just as modern day Israel could be saying that since 1967, for 56, 57 years, we've been in Judea Samaria now. Why have you not succeeded all this time in reconquering that land, recovering that land? Because God gave us that land. Listen, I, Gira, uh, Yiftach, have done nothing wrong to you. We haven't done anything wrong. This happened centuries ago. We didn't change any, any equations. We're not trying to expand our boundaries. And now you want to do evil to me? To make war? Yishpot Hashem al Ben Ben Israel Ben Ben Amon. If you make war, may the God of Israel judge this day between Israel and between the children of Ammon. Below Shema Melch Ben Ammon, and just as the other king of Ammon, who was the king of Ammon, King Hussein in 1967, Ammon, the I've, I've pointed out many times in the past, the capital city of modern day Jordan is Amman. It's named based on the name Ammon. And it's sort of history repeated itself. The king was told, stay out of the war. And he just, Lo Shema Melech B'nei Ammon. The king of Ammon and the king of the people of Ammon would not hearken to the good sage counsel to leave us alone. El Devrei Yiftach, he would not hearken to the words of Yiftach, Asher Sholach Ilav, Atahi, Al Yiftach Ruach Hashem, by Avor Tal Gilad V'et Menashe. And so there was an extraordinary war and Yiftach won. The Jews won by Avor Mitzpah Gilad, Omi Mitzpah Gilad, Avar B'nei Amon, and they successfully marched through Gilad and Menashe, passing Mitzpah of Gilad, and from Mitzpah of Gilad crossed over to the Ammonites. So they marched straight through to the other side, going through Menashe into the land of the Ammon. This is Menashe. Manasseh, Manasseh, and marched across the Jordan River, south of the Sea of Galilee, Lake Canary, and marched into the land of the, um, the land of the Ammonites. And it then goes on to a famous vow that Yiftach made that he should not have made that will take us all a, a little bit out of the discussion. So I don't want to get into that right now. But I, I will take that last set, set two. By Avor Yiftach al Bnei Ammon lilachem bam. So Yiftach fought against the Ammonites to make war against them. By name Hashem biyado, and God gave the Ammonites over to him. By Akem me Arorer ad Boacha minita srim shir biar avel kramim makagedolam od. There was an extraordinary, an extraordinary utter routing. Let's say a maka. A smiting gadol, a great smiting by Kona'u b'nei Ammon b'nei b'nei Israel, and the Ammonites finally surrendered and gave up and submitted to the Jews. And that was really the essence of where I wanted to take our class tonight, particularly, uh, let's bring this to, that we have a special obligation to Eretz Israel, and it's very much part of the Jewish people. And let me say what I mean by that. I think people don't really appreciate it necessarily enough. Let's say somebody comes and says, it's a very common thing for people to say in certain circles, I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm anti-Zionist. I have nothing against the Jews. I'm just against Israel. And this is by now, We've all heard it enough times. It is important when we learn something like the story of Yiftach in Sefer Shoftim, not a Midrash. This is part of our biblical history to understand that the land of Israel, actually, we forget it because we've been in exile for 2,000 years. 
So we have become comfortable in France, in England, in the United States. We get comfortable. So Charles Schumer gets up and he's very, very comfortable. I'm the highest ranking Jew, elected Jew in American history. He's very, very comfortable. And we're all, not only Schumer, everybody here, everybody's very comfortable in America. And Joe Lieberman of blessed memory just passed away and everybody remembers, imagine we had an Orthodox Jew actually ran for vice president of the United States. And depending on, on your take of the Supreme Court decision in Bush v. Gore, and no matter what you think of Bush v. Gore, the fact is Lieberman would have been vice president of the United States if not for all the elderly Jews in Florida who didn't know how to punch, who ended up voting for Pat Buchanan, the anti-Semite. If you take all the Jewish votes in Miami Beach for Pat Buchanan and you gave it to Gore Lieberman, it never would have come to Gore, but it would never come to the Supreme Court. The Jews didn't know how to vote. And the whole idea of putting Lieberman on the ballot was to get the Jewish vote from anyway. But we're so comfortable in America, we forget. Actually, Israel is part of the definition of a Jew. And as long as we don't live in Israel, we're in exile. We are patriotic. Everyone knows how extremely patriotic we are to our respective countries. And my Sunday class, I mean, I've begun with Star Spangled Banner. And I mean, we're, we're very, very patriotic. We love America or whatever country you're in watching from. We love our countries and we're loyal to the and, and we're required in Yerminahu, the book of Jeremiah, we're commanded by God to be loyal to the country in which we live. But we forget that actually Zionism and the bond of the Jewish people to the land of Israel is so central to Judaism that it actually is like eating kosher. Imagine someone comes and says, I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm just trying to ban shechita laws because they are inhumane to animals. But I'm not anti-Semitic. It's nothing to do with Jews. I'm just against shechita. Or up in San Francisco, they tried it a few years ago. I'm not anti-Semitic. We just want to ban circumcision. It was a big, big thing. Uh, certain gay groups up in San Francisco wanted to ban circumcision. And they almost got a, they almost got a uh, what do you call it? The thing on the ballot, a, a uh, proposition on the ballot. Um, thankfully, that was beaten down. They tried it in Santa Monica also. But imagine somebody comes and says, I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm just against circumcision. I think that should be banned. I'm not anti-Semitic. I just think kosher should be banned. I'm not anti-Semitic. I just think it should be banned that you don't work on Saturday. I mean, these are definitional aspects of Judaism. If you say we can't be kosher and we can't do bris and we can't have Shabbos, you essentially are saying we can't be Jewish. And to say that we can't have the land of Israel and that, oh, no, I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm just anti-Zionist. It happens to be that the bond of the people of Israel with the land of Israel is that central. So we're going to wind down for tonight now with just a little bit in the Mishnah Torah where I left off two weeks ago, just a little bit to wrap it together of what I taught here today. And we'll continue it with our next Thursday class. In case you jump out, since we're just past eight o'clock now, just a reminder I'd announced last week, we'll be taking a one month um, spring semester uh, sabbatical in the month of April. I had mentioned that I have a, uh, a, a, a surgery I, I'm undergoing next week, a uh, hiatal hernia surgery. And so um, the doctor said it's going to sort of put me out of commission a little bit for about two weeks. It won't be as easy for me to lecture for an hour. And then in two weeks, when I would be able to be back at it, we'll already be packing for Pesach and uh, turning our houses upside down in Pesach. And that's going to be through, I believe, the last day of March. And I believe uh, uh, April uh yeah, last day of April. And then March 1st, Pesach is over. So uh, May, May 1st, I'm sorry. So uh, we'll be taking off. We will have class on Sunday. I'm still deciding whether we're going to meet on Tuesday. Keep an eye out on your email. Uh, but this will be our last Thursday class. And then we'll resume th uh, un until the spring semester break. And then we'll resume the first Thursday in May. Again, likewise, we'll meet Sunday, God willing. And then take a break till the first Sunday in May. And I'll, I'll decide, I'll know more by Sunday whether we're going to meet on Tuesday. But anyways, we break right now. The last thing, I want to just 
wrap this up in a piece of very short piece of Mishnah Torah that brings together what I was just saying, which is where we left off with Mishnah Torah. In other words, I'm not pulling it out from another area. It's part of the continuation. I saw what we learned last time in Mishnah Torah, Kings and Wars, Hilchot Malachim, Umilchamot, Asur Latate, Me'arts and Sorel, Lechutzal Aretz Lolam. A Jew who lives in Israel is forbidden ever to leave Israel. And there's exceptions. But in and of itself, in the first instance, a Jew is not allowed to leave Israel. If you're born in Israel or you make Aliyah or you travel there, uh, there's a very strong understanding under the Rambam, you're not allowed to leave. And I explained in that last class, that's why Rav Moshe Feinstein and the Lubavitcher Rebbe never moved, to, never went to Israel. People ask, how is it that Rav Moshe Feinstein never went to Israel? How is it the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi of Chabad at 770 Eastern Parkway in Crown Heights, never went to Israel? And the reason is because it was their opinion that if they would set foot in Israel, they'd never be allowed to leave. And since each of them in different ways had important missions to continue performing on behalf of the Jews in the exile. There are still are a lot of Jews in the exile. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe had a mission, he believed, in building Chabad. And he needed to be where he was. And Rav Moshe, who was the Gadol Hador, the giant of the generation for the Jews outside of Israel and for many in Israel. But other than that, like, what about those people in Israel who Rosh Hashanah go to Uman, that place in Lithuania at, the, at uh, Rabbi uh, Nachum's? Uh, you're not allowed to do that. It's a sin. It's a, but, but a lot of people do it. Yeah, a lot of people do a lot of things that are wrong. Uh, all rabbinic authorities will tell you, you're not allowed to go to Uman. Uh, if you're in America, you want to go to Uman. It's, it's dumb, but you can do it. But to, from Eretz Israel to go to Uman for Rosh Hashanah, it's against Halacha. Not allowed to do it. Not allowed to go anywhere except the following. And this is the basis on which you see Orthodox Jews, Torah observant Jews who have been in Israel and have moved out. And and nobody shuns somebody like, it's, it's acceptable. It depends. El Elomo Torah. As we said, if you can learn Torah better, let's say you have a Rebbe in Israel, but the Rebbe outside of Israel you could learn better with, or your Rebbe in Israel, for his reasons, is going out of Israel. And you need that because some people learn best with a certain rabbi better than with another rabbi. You're allowed to follow your rabbi to learn Torah, Olisa Isha. Let's say you cannot find a suitable wife in Israel, and you can find a suitable wife outside of Israel. What, there's no women in Israel who are wonderful? Of course there are. What, there's no women in Of course. But, you know, each individual has a unique personality, a uh, way of looking at things, uh, emotions and uh, finances and... Uh, and all kinds of cultural and what, what not. And sometimes it's like, why do people end up marrying people from other cities? Why do they end up, you're living in California, you can't marry, why did they meet, meet somebody in New York or Minnesota? Because they find somebody that was, they believe more suitable. So if you could find a more suitable mar matrimonial match for that, you could leave Israel. Or to save yourself from non-Jews, let's say, God forbid, the Romans are attacking and they're massacring left and right with well, the Crusaders a thousand years ago under Richard the Lionhearted. And they're just slaughtering Jews. And there's no choice. Then you could leave the Achsor Aretz, and we'll close with this right here. And then when the opportunity affords itself, if you have married that suitable match or, we, or, or your Torah learning once again can succeed as well or better in Israel or whatnot, then you go back to live in the land of Israel. So Israel and is central to being Jewish and the Jewish ethic of war and Jewish values. You're not allowed to go around massacring other people and you're not allowed to hurt innocent civilians and you're not allowed, not allowed to do all kinds of horrible things. And nobody says you should and nobody defends that. But you absolutely are allowed to defend every inch of Eretz Israel.